What is up, everybody? JT Sports here, back at you guys with another episode of the JT Sports Podcast. On this episode, I'm going to be giving you guys my college football week 11 reactions. We're going to be talking about Washington's upset over Oregon, Alabama beating Ole Miss on the road, why TCU is the second best team in college football after the win over Texas, and what are the Pac-12's playoff hopes after the chaotic weekend of football that we just saw unfold in the Pac-12 conference. Arizona upset UCLA. Washington went on the road and beat Oregon. We're going to talk about all that. But before we start, if this is your first time listening to the JT Sports Podcast, welcome. I appreciate you for tuning in. Make sure that you follow me on all of my social media platforms. You can follow me on Twitter at JT Sports underscore underscore and on Instagram at JT Sports underscore. Also, make sure that you check out the JT Sports podcast available on all podcasting platforms Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcast from. The JT Sports podcast is available. Make sure that you guys go ahead, check that out, leave a five star review. Lastly, if you're listening to this episode of the pod on YouTube, make sure that you go ahead, leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Washington upsets Oregon 37 to 34. This was a game that I was really confident in Washington being able to cover. However, If you would have told me that Washington was going to outright beat Oregon on the road, I wouldn't have disagreed with you, but at the same time, I would have had a hard time seeing that go down, but it happened. Michael Penix had a fantastic performance and Bo Nix played well. Bo Nix has been the talking point. Of the Pac-12 conference all year. He pretty much has been the king of the Pac-12. And yet not enough people are talking about the kind of season that Michael Penix has had with the Huskies. And let's not forget about where Michael Penix was in his career prior to arriving in Washington. He was at Indiana for the last couple of seasons. He was dealing with injuries. And outside of that 2020 campaign, he didn't really look all that great. He gets to Washington with Kalen DeBoer. They have some familiarity with each other. And things click. He's being able to stay healthy. Not only that, but in this game, Michael Penix... Show some mobility. And I was really surprised when I saw Michael Penix running for a first down in this game. I knew he had some mobility in him, but I thought after the injuries that he sustained over the course of his time at Indiana, I kind of thought that aspect of his game was gone. But he showed some wills in this game. On top of that, his arm strength once again was on full display. He threw a pass right by a Oregon safety. And the Oregon safety wasn't in bad pos- position per se. It just was an incredible throw. There are not too many quarterbacks alive right now that have the kind of arm talent that Michael Penix possesses. A lot of people keep talking about Will Levis. I don't really see the hype, honestly. If you're looking at a quarterback who needs a little bit of development, but has a lot of potential, great arm, a little bit of mobility, Michael Penix is your guy. And I think as we progress throughout the remainder of this season and we get closer to the NFL combine and the NFL draft process, more people are going to start talking about Michael Penix, but he had a fantastic performance in this game and he's had fantastic performances all year long for the Huskies. I was really impressed with how not only he responded, but how this team responded 
in the face of adversity in this game. Late in the fourth, well, late in this game, Michael Penix threw an interception inside of the red zone. A really bad one, too. And Washington's defense, surprisingly, they only hold Oregon to a field goal. And this was after Oregon just engineered a 10-minute drive. They had the ball for 10 minutes, and I'm just watching, and I'm just like, oh, my goodness, Michael Penix. You just sold. You just sold the game. Your defense is not going to be able to get off the field, but somehow, some way, Washington's defense was able to find a way. I don't know how they did it, but they dug down deep, and they finally were able to stop Oregon's drive because I thought that Oregon was going to run the rest of the clock The way that Oregon dominated the fourth quarter on the ground, not just the fourth quarter, but the entire game on the ground was really impressive. They had 592 total yards on offense. 312 of those yards came on the ground. And we knew that Washington's defense wasn't good. And we also knew that Oregon's defense wasn't good going into this game. So, of course, there was going to be a lot of points scored. However, I was not expecting for Oregon to have over 300 yards on the ground, have the ball for over 30 minutes in this game, and still lose. For Washington, their defense came up big in the fourth quarter. The stat sheet ain't going to show you what this defense did in the big moments of this game. But if you go back and you watch the replay or the highlights of this game in the fourth quarter, Washington's defense got some major stops in this game. They also got a sack. Something that Oregon's offensive line hasn't allowed too many of this season. As a matter of fact, going into this game, they only allowed one sack on the season. So Washington's defensive line was able to get pressure on Bo Nix and company in the fourth. And we also got to take into account that Bo Nix obviously was hobbled. He wasn't 100%. He was out of the game despite begging to come in on one of the most, if not the most important play of this game, Oregon's fourth and one attempt, which Washington was able to stop and get them off the field. And then Michael Penix, he delivered, just like he did last week in Washington's win over Oregon State. He helped engineer a 90-something yard drive, put Washington in the field goal range, and they got the win against Oregon State. This was kind of a similar situation, but not 100% exact. Michael Penix has to respond after throwing an interception. He goes right down the field, puts Washington in position to win the game. All you need is for your defense to not sell the game. Washington holds. Both defenses we knew were not good. And they played pretty much the way that we expected them to play. However, I didn't expect Washington to get ran over or bulldozed on the ground the way they did. And Oregon, defensively, they kind of played how I, not even kind of, they played exactly how I thought they would play. Washington's offense with these receivers were way too talented to get shut down. Many people were quick to reference Oregon and Georgia trying to compare the defenses and things like that. But I was really telling people like, bro, Oregon and Georgia are not even on the same planet when it comes to defense. And I know that you do have Georgia's former defensive coordinator, but Oregon's defense is going to take a while to rebuild. Maybe they need to hit that transfer portal up after the season or something, but their secondary has some huge problems. So if you thought as a Ducks fan, that Oregon secondary was going to be able to slow down Michael Penix and company. You kind of were, maybe you were overlooking Washington's personnel because these receivers are all NFL caliber wide receivers. 
So there was no way that Oregon's defense, with the fact that they struggled to get pressure on the quarterback all season, they haven't been good getting off the field in third down situations. There just wasn't really too many ways I could have seen Oregon getting off the field, which is why I picked Washington to cover. But at the same time, I didn't see Washington winning this game. Now, I knew they had a chance, but for them to win this game, going on the road against Oregon, it was going to take a brilliant effort. And Oregon is a really tough place to win at. Prior to this loss, they had one of the longest home home field win streaks in college football. I forgot the exact amount of games, but it's been some time since Oregon last suffered a loss at home. And it took Washington playing their best football to do so and a little bit of defense. And Washington's defense has kind of played a little bit better in the second half of games over the course of the last couple of weeks. They got gashed on the run on the ground against Oregon State, came back in the second half, made adjustments. Oregon State's run game didn't really do anything in the second half. So Washington earns their eighth win of the season. They're eight and two. They still are pretty much in the mix for the Pac-12 championship. Meanwhile, you have Oregon. They still control their own destiny when it comes to getting to the Pac-12 championship. But when it comes to their college football playoff hopes, they're pretty much in the drain. And along with pretty much the Pac-12 conference playoff hopes, as a whole but we're going to talk about that a little bit later but before i begin the last thing i want to talk about oregon's running backs bucky irving noah winnington they were sensational i mean every time these guys were toting the rock it was damn near first down every single time and you look at oregon i just feel like the lar- a large reason why the Huskies won was because they got out to a faster start. And I alluded to that when I did my preview and prediction for this game, that if Washington was going to win or have a chance at pulling off the upset, they couldn't afford to start out slow. Washington hasn't really been a great team on the road this year because they have gotten off to slow starts. Happened against UCLA. However, in this game they actually were clicking from the get-go Oregon actually was the team that started off kind of slow offensively offensively and it wasn't like they got shut down or anything like that but they did have the fumble early so Washington got out to the faster start and it kind of set the tone for the game so Oregon Your playoff hopes are pretty much in the drain, but you still do have a shot at playing for the Pac-12 championship. You do have to play a really good Utah team this weekend. But Oregon, I think this season definitely has been a huge success. I don't really think anybody expected Oregon to be as good as what they have been up to this point. Bo Nix is playing at an insanely high and efficient level it's just that the huskies went on the road and they executed at a really high level and michael Penix is showing a lot of people hey bo nix isn't the only quarterback in the pac-12 that's good michael Penix has been one of the best stories of this college football season and if you are somebody who is a big fan of the draft Like myself, keep your eyes on Michael Penix during the NFL draft process. I promise you, a lot of people are going to start talking about him once they start observing him and they start seeing how much arm talent he has. Yeah. Alabama went on the road and beat Ole Miss 30-24. to Now, Alabama didn't dominate, okay, Junkins was terrorizing the Tide for the first half of this game. His stat line the in this matchup was 25 carries, 135 rushing yards, 5.4 yards per carry, and he had two touchdowns. But Alabama still won the game. 
You know, Quinshawn Junkins had a phenomenal performance. And Ole Miss was up 17-7 to at one point, midway through the second quarter. Yet, Alabama still found a way to come back from behind on the road. And they did it without one of their best players in Jameer Gibbs, who ended up having to leave the game due to an injury. So you're wondering, okay, without Jameer Gibbs, Who's going to be Bryce Young's safety blanket on third down? Because if you've been watching the Tide all season, every time they get put in a third down situation, they spam the ball to Jameer Gibbs, and Jameer Gibbs bails them out. Ole Miss didn't allow that to happen. And to their credit, even before Jameer Gibbs had to exit this game, they were fantastic when it came to limiting the impact that he had on offense for the Tide. However, the Tide still have Bryce Young. And Bryce Young, like he always does, he digs into his little magic hat and he pulls out the Bryce Young magic tricks. The Bryce Young magic is something that can only be described in one way. Every time Alabama's backs are against the wall, they tell Bryce Young, hey man, Go over there and go get your little magic hat real quick. We need you to pull a little trick out real quick. They pull a couple of cards. Bryce Young tells Nick Saban, pick a card. Nick Saban pulls a card and Bryce Young says, okay, coach, I got you. And he goes and he gets it done. For Ole Miss in this game, I was really surprised that they were hanging around. I thought Alabama was going to cover. And I probably was a little bit, you know overzealous for this game in a sense. I kind of knew that the chances of Alabama covering in this game were pretty low, but I kind of went with them to cover just because I wanted them to prove a point. That didn't happen, but they still proved a point because they won this game. One of my biggest keys for the Rebels winning this game was how efficient can they be throwing the football in big moments. We know that the run game was going to be there. However, was Jackson Dart going to be able to make the big throws in the big moments? He wasn't able to. He played a pretty good game. As a matter of fact, I would say that this is probably one of the best games that I've seen Jackson Dart play this season. I don't know about the other performances that he's had. I haven't watched those. But from... The Ole Miss games that I've watched this year, Kentucky, LSU, Vanderbilt, and this one, I think that Dart had a really good performance, and this was probably the best one he had throwing the football. However, the offensive line fell apart in the second half when it came to pass blocking. Alabama was really getting after him. And plus, what has hindered Old Miss all year hindered them again. Their inability to hit the big throws in the passing game in critical moments. There were some throws that Jackson Dart left on the field. And there were some throws that he didn't really have a chance to get a chance to throw. Because the offensive line didn't give him a chance to throw the ball. So for Jackson Dart, he had a pretty good performance You also look at what he does on the ground for Ole Miss as well. If I had to give him a grade for his performance in this game, I honestly had to give him a B plus. I think that Jackson Dart played insanely well in this game. It's just that in the fourth quarter, there were really big throws that he couldn't make. And it's kind of been the same story with him and this whole entire Ole Miss offense For pretty much the whole entire season. The run game has been there every game. But the passing game, when you need to rely on it to win, hasn't been able to deliver. The forced fumble that Ole Miss had early in this game helped them have momentum early. However, similar to their loss against LSU, 45-20 to on the road, 
They played well in the first half. The run game was there. Their defense looked pretty good. And then this, in the second half, LSU came out. They keyed the run. They forced, L- they forced Ole Miss to put the ball in the air. And they got in trouble. Plus their defense couldn't really get too many stops. And after that, LSU just took control. Now, this game didn't exactly turn out that way, but it had a similar way of playing out. Yes, it was a lot closer, but I still think eventually when you got into late in the fourth quarter, Alabama really started to take control and really grab the win from Ole Miss. Running back Jace McClellan, he was a large reason for why the Tide were able to win this game in the end. I think he was the closer for the Tide. And normally, Jameer Gibbs or Bryce Young ends up being the closer for this team late in games. But McClellan, he was sensational. On the game, overall, he finished with 19 carries, 84 rushing yards, 4.4 yards per attempt. He was really good in the fourth. Every time they went to him, he was picking up chunks of yardage. Bryce Young, as I mentioned earlier, consistently delivers every time Alabama's back is against the wall. I wonder, what would Alabama's record be this season if they didn't have Bryce Young? Because there are so many times they it just seems like you got them against the ropes. You got them down for the count. And Bryce Young just spams the Bryce Young magic and finds a way to put Alabama in position to win this game. Alabama is 8-2. Ole Miss is 8-2. Ole Miss surprisingly is only two losses in at this point in the season. I thought that this kind of was going to, going to be a little bit of a retooling year for Lane Kiffin and company. When you look at how much they lost over the course of the off season, I think that this has been a really successful season for Ole Miss, regardless of how their last two games end up. And I hope that he doesn't end up leaving for Auburn or another job. I really like him at Ole Miss. I think that as long as he stays at Ole Miss, I think this program has a level where maybe eventually you can end up beating Alabama, not just beating them, but being able to get to the SEC championship. I think next year with Jackson Dart coming back, going into year two under this system, you also get Quinshawn Junkins for another year. I think that this offense is going to improve when you look at the passing game. The fact that Jackson Dart is going to get way more comfortable. Watch out for Ole Miss next season in 2023. I know we still have a couple of weeks left of 2022, but, you know, it's nothing wrong with looking ahead. But let me know what you guys think about Alabama's 30 to 24 win against Ole Miss on the road. A lot of you guys may be like, oh, JT, Alabama was supposed to win this game. Yeah, they were supposed to win, but let's be honest. If they would have lost this game, you would have been berating Alabama. You would have kept on dragging Alabama like how many people were after they lost against LSU last week. If they would have lost this game, the Alabama is on the decline continues. Alabama's falling off continues. I think that this was a game that Alabama had to win. Okay, it may not have been a big win in terms of making it to the college football playoffs or the SEC championship, but I think that this was a game that we needed to see Alabama win on the road for us to still view Alabama as one of the elite teams in this sport. And I know we're not going to completely write off Alabama because of this season. Let's face it, they're probably going to end up winning 10, 11 games, and they're going to be right back in the conversation in the conversation next season. But we kind of looked at Alabama and how they have performed on the road this year. They haven't been good. And this Ole Miss team definitely was good enough to beat Alabama. 
They just couldn't get the big throws downfield late in the game, and that's why the Tide remain remain the best team or one of the best programs in the West because it's just like every time you think you got this team down and every time it seems like this team is starting to decline, every time you count them, you count them out, you write off Nick Saban, they come right back. Really impressive win for Alabama. May not be impressive to a lot of you guys watching this, but this was a game that Alabama had to win on the road. Place they struggled at all year, they got it done. TCU beat Texas 17-10 Saturday night. And I haven't talked about TCU that much on the podcast this season, and a lot of people have been coming at me about it. I apologize. But you know what they say, no time better than never. And now I'm talking about TCU. When you look at the Horn Frogs, right, Um, this team, we had questions about their defense. Well, their defense looked really damn good against Texas. Quinn Ewers looked garbage in this game. I love Quinn Ewers. He's one of my favorite players in college football, but he was off in this game. Not only was he off, but Texas offense was off. B. John Robinson. This is somebody who has been going ham over the last couple of weeks. He was held to 29 yards on 12 carries in this game. Not only that, but Texas as a team only had 28 rushing yards. Their defensive line for TCU got after the Longhorns' young offensive line all night. I mean, Texas just looked out of sorts in this game. And it's funny because they was at, they were at home. They had the home field advantage. And it looked like they got rattled in this game. Now, TCU, this wasn't the kind of game that we are accustomed to seeing out of them. You know, normally we're used to seeing them put up 40 points a game. But I think this game showed us why TCU is the second best team in college football because we thought that this team could only win two ways. Either they outscore you or they have to be able to come back from behind against you and get a couple of miracles here and there. But going into this game, they went on the road. They were going against the Texas team who many people picked to beat them. And they proved the doubters wrong once again. This team showed that they have multiple ways to beat you. And I think that that is something that is an absolute must when you're trying to evaluate and analyze if a team is not only capable of making it to the college football playoffs, but being able to make a run at a national championship. Because in college football, as we already know, anything can happen on any given Saturday. One week, a team could annihilate somebody, and then that same team who just got done annihilating somebody coming off a big win, they end up getting upset by a team that they're a favorite a favorite to beat. So you look at TCU and the fact that they can win in multiple different ways, it's a large reason why this team has been able to come back from behind. It's also why they are still unbeaten and why I think this is the second best team in college football. They are 5-0 against teams ranked inside the top 25. They got wins against Oklahoma, Kansas, Oklahoma State, Kansas State, and recently just Texas. Ohio State, Michigan, neither, neither of those two teams have the resume that TCU has. And I understand that when a lot of people rank teams, They're ranking teams based off how talented they are. However, when you're doing these college football playoff rankings, I think that these rankings have to be based off 
week to week performance. It's like, yes, Ohio State and Michigan are more talented teams than TCU. However, you look at what TCU has done this season, who they've played, who they've beaten, and the metrics show that they've had a tougher strength of schedule. They played in a tougher conference. I think that TCU, based off these analytics and these metrics, I think it's fair to say they are the second best team in college football. They played one of the tougher schedules. I mean, they play in one of the toughest conferences in the sport. Ohio State, Michigan, they're good teams, but where's their resume? And I understand that we do have to take talent into account. I do know that there are going to be plenty of Michigan and Ohio State fans who come on the comment section for this segment and say, Oh, JT, if Michigan and Ohio State were to play TCU right now, TCU would lose by multiple possessions. Okay, cool. I don't care about that. I care about the overall body of work right now. I care about the resume. And the resume right now shows that TCU is the second best team in college football. We have to start rewarding teams for playing tough schedules. We just can't say, oh, TCU's a good team, but they're not the second best team in college football, JT, because they're not as good as Ohio State. Well, yeah, they may not have the the horses or the five and four stars as Ohio State and Michigan do, but I mean, damn. They have played one of the toughest schedules in college football. So, I mean, we're we're just not going to give them credit for that? I mean, if we want to keep putting Ohio State over TCU when TCU is beating teams like Texas and Ohio State is beating teams like Indiana and Northwestern. Okay, cool. I can understand it if you still want to use the whole talent argument but i mean don't we shouldn't we be doing these rankings somewhat based off week to week performance and based off the week to week performance and who tcu has beaten they're the second best team in college football they got a good roster max duggins probably is the offensive player of the year for this conference in my opinion if you want to give it to b john robinson Cool. And if you want to give it to Quinn Johnston, Max Duggan's teammate, cool. But I mean, Max Duggan's has played at an insane level this season. 2,531 passing yards, 25 touchdowns to only two interceptions. And he's completing 65% of his passes. He's playing in, at an insane level right now. Kendra Miller was the large reason why TCU was able to upset Texas last week. Oh, I wouldn't really call it an upset, but most people do view it as an upset because most people pick Texas, but he carried the he carried the Horn Frogs. I mean he had six yards per carry, 138 total yards on the ground, a touchdown, and he did this with 21 attempts. Imagine if TCU could have gave Kendra Miller 35 carries in this game. Oh my goodness. He might have went for 300 yards. Just about. Texas had no answer for him defensively. And this was a slow night for TCU's offense. But even though this may not have been their best offensive performance, the three best players on offense came up and delivered for TCU and Sonny Dykes in this game. Max Duggins played pretty well. Kendra Miller probably was the player of the game. And Quentin Johnston had a 31 touchdown reception in the fourth quarter, which pretty much sealed the victory for TCU at that point, putting them up 17-3. This TCU team is the second best team in college football. I don't give a damn about what the 24-7 team talent composite rankings say. I don't care who would be favored on a neutral field, home field. I don't care. Based off the resume, TCU is the second best team in college football. TCU has the track record. 
They pass the eye test. They can win in multiple different ways. This is one of the best teams in college football. When the college football playoff rankings come out Tuesday night, TCU should be number two. The last thing I want to talk about are the Pac-12's playoff hopes. The Pac-12 has been one of the most entertaining conferences to watch this season. My favorite, personally. And with this conference being so entertaining, there's been a lot of good games featuring a lot of good teams. And unfortunately, when you have good teams, you get good games. But unfortunately, with their... with there being so many good teams in this conference this season, they're now starting to beat up on each other. And it's gotten to the point where the Pac-12 playoff hopes are pretty much over. Their best chance is USC with one loss. USC does have a chance to get to the playoffs if they win out. Their last two remaining games are against UCLA and against Notre Dame. Now both of these two teams are ranked. So you beat them, you boost your resume up, you have the wins against teams ranked inside of the playoff rankings. Then if you can win your conference championship, rather that be against Oregon or whoever, I think that USC, if they can remain at only one loss, They can get in if they win out and they win this conference. Now, who are they going to get in over? That's a different conversation. But I do think that the committee is going to award conference champions. I don't think that a one-loss USC that wins the Pac-12 is going to get looked over for a one-loss Tennessee squad that didn't make it to the conference championship but we have seen a lot of craziness play out when it comes to the committee over the last couple of years so you never really know but really honestly do you even trust for USC to be able to to win out because I mean they lost by one point to Utah already and this team is pretty flawed And many people, when you listen to them talk about Trojans football this year, they seem really surprised when they think about where this football team is at this point of the season. If you would have told some people that USC was going to be, what, 9-1 and at this point, some people probably would have been a little shocked because we talk about how the... Offensive line depth hasn't really been there. The depth on the defensive line hasn't been there. So a lot of people have questioned the depth that USC has had up front. Not just that, but their defense at times can be too turnover dependent. However, Caleb Williams and Lincoln Riley and this offense has been absolutely fire. Caleb Williams looks like he's a Heisman finalist, in my opinion. Even though you did lose your star running back and die, I think that USC is going to be able to have some guys in that running back room be able to step up and pick up the production there. So for Utah, who is the second other team, who has the second best chance of being able to get to the playoffs for this conference, Their path isn't as set in stones as USC. And we, and I just said, even if USC wins out, I think they would get in. However, it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what the committee thinks. However, I do think that the Pac-12 being so strong this year, I think gives USC a really good chance of getting in. However, if USC has to be discussed with one loss, what makes you think that Utah has a path at two losses. LSU having two losses is different from the two losses that Utah has. Because, yes, both of these two teams have losses against unranked teams. Or, I don't think LSU has an unranked. 
LSU's loss came against Tennessee at home, and then they lost to FSU at the start of the season. Okay, yeah. And then you look at Utah, week one, they lost on the road to Florida, and then they lost to USC. Well, no, they beat USC. They lost to UCLA. That's who it was. So they got two losses. And plus, you have the loss to Florida earlier in the season. Like, I don't think the committee is going to give Utah a nod over anybody, even if they do win the conference. I mean, you already have two losses. We barely want to put LSU in if they win out. So what makes anybody think that the Utes are going to be able to get in, even if they can win the Pac-12 and beat Oregon this weekend? Which, they have to beat Oregon on the road. So, we don't even know if Utah is even going to be in position where they even have still two losses. They probably could have three or four by the time we get to um the selection show. And the committee decides on the four teams who are going to get in this year. I look at Utah. This team is pretty good, but they had some hiccups this season. You had the loss against Florida. You shouldn't have lost that game. Utah's hopes of making it to the playoffs were over when they lost to UCLA. So I don't really think that Utah has a shot at getting in regardless of of what happens. I mean, even if Georgia suffers a loss and Ohio State suffers a loss, you're still going to have to worry about Michigan. You're going to have to have so much chaos happen. And even if that chaos happens, you're probably going to need another team or two to drop another game. I don't really see a path for Utah getting in with two losses, regardless of what happens. USC, on the other hand, if they can win out, they beat UCLA, they win against Notre Dame, you got your two ranked wins there. You can win your Pac-12 championship, you have your conference championship there. At that point, you're going to have two SEC teams that you have to worry about. And we all have a feeling that two SEC teams are going to get in, barring something catastrophic happening. So either Georgia's going to get in, we know they're pretty much a lock, and it's either going to be LSU or Tennessee. If LSU wins the SEC championship, they're probably going to get in. If they lose, we're probably going to see Tennessee. So, at this point, you're down to two spots because the SEC already has two spots on res- on reservations. Clemson looks done. I'm not counting them out, but I just don't think their schedule and with how the ACC has been this season is going to be able to catapult them back into the top four. So... I think that if this is a head-to-head argument and the last spot is coming down to a one-loss Clemson and a one-loss USC, you're giving it to USC easily. Tougher schedule, better conference, okay? But with Clemson there, even if they suffer another loss or even if even if Clemson is able to win their conference, I just don't really think that winning the ACC means that much this year. That conference hasn't really been great. So I think that the Pac-12 champion over the ACC champion probably favors the Pac-12 champion. Now, what about the Big Ten? Okay, because the ACC, outside of Clemson, maybe UNC, you don't really have to worry about anybody. But the Big Ten... You got Ohio State and you got Michigan. Both of those two teams are about to play in a couple of days. So eventually, one of those two teams are going to end up with their first loss of the season. Maybe at that point, barring what happens this week if they don't lose. So you probably have to think that that's going to be an elimination game. However, I do think that there's a chance that we could see two Big Ten teams, and to the college football playoffs, I'm not going to rule that out. However, if we're going based off this situation, this hypothetical scenario, 
let's say one of these two teams loses, the other goes on to win the Big Ten, the Big Ten has a spot at the table, okay? So now you got one spot. I think that spot is either going to go to USC or you need TCU to lose somewhere down the stretch. And I do think that TCU is more than capable of being able to fall somewhere down the stretch versus rather it be Baylor or in the Big 12 championship. But for right now, it looks like for USC and the Pac-12 to get into the playoffs, they need a lot of help. And they need a lot of things to happen. I mean, you need LSU to lose to Georgia. Or you just need LSU to take another loss in general. Then, you probably would like to see Clemson suffer another loss. Just because you just would not have to worry about them at all if they take another loss. But if they do remain with one loss, they could kind of throw a wrench into the decision there. So, Then, you got Bama. Oh, I almost forgot about Bama. Yeah, they're there. I don't think... I don't think the committee, excuse me, is going to put a two-loss Alabama team in, regardless of what happens. I mean, yeah, you do have some good wins, but I just don't think Alabama had two losses. You could really justify that over a one-loss Pac-12 champion in USC. So I don't really think USC fans have to worry about Alabama. Now, we already talked about LSU and Tennessee. So really, the Pac-12, they don't really control their own destiny. You're going to need USC to win out. And honestly, I don't know if they're going to be able to win out. I think that with how this conference has went this season... We're going to continue to see them beat up on each other. And USC is going to lose somewhere within the next couple of weeks. I don't know if it's going to be against. I don't know if it's going to be in the Pac-12 championship. I don't know if it's going to be against UCLA. But I do have a feeling that this team is going to slip up somewhere within the next couple of weeks. So I don't really think that the Pac-12 has a shot at getting into the playoffs this season. Yes, USC is still in the conversation. They're still in the race. However, the chances of USC being able to win out, I think, are really small. Really small. Especially if they have to face Oregon in the Pac-12 championship game, I probably would take Oregon. But... This is it for this episode of the JT Sports Podcast. I appreciate you guys for tuning in to this episode. Make sure that you guys follow me on all of my social media platforms. You can follow me on Twitter at JT Sports underscore underscore and on Instagram at JT Sports underscore. Make sure that you check out the JT Sports Podcast available on all podcasting platforms. Wherever you get your podcasts from the JT Sports Podcast is available. Spotify, Apple, Google, Amazon. Make sure that you go ahead, check out the JT Sports Podcast and leave a five-star review. I appreciate you guys for listening to this episode of the JT Sports Podcast. And I'll see you guys.